Heike, ja. Thank you, Jacques, for your kind introduction. It's a real honor to be here at McGill University to give this presentation. I haven't been at McGill for quite a few years, so it's a pleasure to be here once again. How many here are students? Okay, great. How many are graduate students? How many are undergrad? Faculty members? Okay, quite a few. Yeah, some, some nice friends, young nice friends here. And how about just the general public from outside the university? Okay, that's great. So, so a nice mixture. How many are concerned about environmental problems? Okay, and what problem sticks out in your mind? Which one is most important to you at the present time? Water. Water? Okay. Climate change. Climate change, yeah. Any others? Risk. Sorry? Solid waste management. Oh, right, risk management. Solid waste management. She's an expert in that. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Jing. Mining. Mining, right? Yeah. Yeah, there are a lot of really tough problems. And right from the start, my main research interests have always been sort of environmental water problems. My PhD was in hydrology. But what I discovered was that we lacked a lot of, let's say, good systems tools to help us look at this problem. See the big overall problems, how the different parts of the system connect together. We have our societal systems, our physical systems. We have decision makers, agents working within those, they're in conflict. And how do we take that all into account to try to come up with a solution that works? So that's sort of overall what I'm trying to do. What I'm going to do this evening, however, is just give an example of a conflict resolution methodology that we actually developed from scratch, the mathematics and everything, because we wanted to look at these tough environmental problems. I'm going to choose one which is also very important, the groundwater conflict. We do also, by the way, look at climate change. But brownfields, how many have heard of brownfields? Or in general, just toxic pollution of the underground water. This is a very serious problem. Basically, in China now, it's becoming one big brownfield where, have, where they have all this industrial development. Unfortunately, they didn't learn from us like they should have. Hundreds of thousands of them in the United States and Europe, and it's a real tough problem. So I'm going to take a practical application later on and show you how that works. The work that I did over the years wasn't me. It was mainly my great students that I had the honor of working with for many, many years and some very good colleagues. And we've had a lot of fun putting this together. So that always makes it especially nice when you can do things together. We have students from all over the world there. That's behind the grad house at Waterloo. How many have been at the grad house? OK, up here. OK, that's very good. If you want to defeat Waterloo and research, burn down the grad house. That's where all the good ideas are made. So this was the citation. I think I already read, read, mentioned my main ideas here, the things that we're taking a look at. Overall, you could say it's environmental systems engineering. And we're really using, sometimes we use systems thinking methodologies. How do we really think about things well, put it in perspective, understand the problem better, and then come up with a solution which is actually implemented and works. So we're really interested in how do we do enhanced decision making when you somehow try to take into account the social sciences and the physical sciences. This here is Sylvie Romanowski. She's actually the daughter of Miroslav Romanowski, who died quite a while ago. He, he, he was interested in the environmental area. That was not his research, but he's very concerned about environmental problems. So he very nicely funded this medal, and as part of it, well, you've won this award, but we want you to go from here and go out there and speak to other people so you can spread the word around. And I guess that's just a comment where, in general, probably scientists could do a better job and engineers trying to let the, know, the public what's happening. This was, this was actually my first presentation. That was in Halifax. Uh, on the far left there, we have the, Dr. Meslin, who's head of the Council of Canadian Academies. There's Sylvie. And then on, on the far right there is the current president of the Royal Society of Canada, Chad Gatfield. So we had a nice discussion there. My presentation at that one was actually climate change. We worked on an expert panel, which I co-chaired. Maybe at the end, I might just mention a few things about climate change. But that was a talk that I gave in Halifax. These, these were some representatives from Waterloo. Our president, Hamble Opter, and the right just became a member of, of the Royal Society of Canada. So we were celebrating that. And you can see Sylvie Romanowski. 
So here are the objectives then. I want to illustrate the graph model for conflict resolution. Like I said, we develop a lot of different methodologies, and I'm going to sh show you how it works by actually looking at a groundwater contamination dispute which actually took place. So here's sort of the yin and yang. You'll see this on the South Korean flag. But over here, you have your societal problems. There you have your physical systems problems. We try to develop tools in both areas, decision tools, physical systems, societal systems, but there's always that interaction. And how can we capture that with respect to the problem that we're looking at? So one way to do it, we have tools to use at the societal level, tools from economics, systems engineering, psychology, sociology, which could help us. Then at the physical systems realm, we have our physical systems model. So when I get into this conflict in a few minutes, I'll mention some of the things they had to do from the physical systems point of view. But it's very important that we take into account all of this. How many are studying water resources and environmental issues here at the university? Okay, well, if anybody's in management, actually a lot of really good papers have been published in the water resources in civil engineering journals because they've always dealt with both the societal problems and the physical systems problems. So as I've given this to, to engineers in the past here in civil engineering, so I just sort of pat them on the back. You've actually done some pretty good work over the years. <coughs> Excuse me, as I mentioned, they have their societal decision analysis models they've developed, the physical systems realm, and then from the systems point of view, we try to bring that all together so we can come up with better decisions. Where are some key fields where they've come up with these operational decision-making approaches? What we're assuming here, they have a mathematical basis to them. The techniques I'll talk about in a few minutes is all set theory, logic, and graph theory, but there have been a lot of tools developed within operational research. This was just started prior to World War I. The English thought that the Germans might bomb the UK, their industrial facilities, key military sites and things like that. They tried to use a radar system to detect German planes when they carried out some experiments. They found the radar systems didn't work well. They had radar systems along the coast of England. Then they pretended there was a bombing run from the UK. Lo and behold, the system failed terribly. Does anybody want to guess why? The, Oh, Jock, come up here. You're, <laughs> come on down here. <laughs> okay. Here. Felicitas, yeah. Here's the University of Waterloo pen. He guessed it right out. <laughs> well done. That was exactly the problem. They had the information at, let's say, about 40 different radar bases, and they failed to communicate the information. So they couldn't really predict where everything was going. So it takes a lot of coordination besides, let's say, the hard technology when you make decisions. In this case, where were the Germans probably going to bomb? So a lot of good stuff developed in there over the years, of optimization techniques, queuing theory, many, many different techniques. And another one was systems engineering. And today the jargon is actually system of systems engineering. This is the latest thing that we're looking at. Just what I mentioned earlier, we have our societal systems, our physical systems, the interaction, how can we solve problems which actually occur within that environment and come up with good decisions to solve them? So there's a lot of good literature there. And let me now, since I'm going to be using a little bit of what's called game theory in my presentation, let me just give you a quick overview. How many here have used, let's say, of the students' game theory in their research? Any students here? You've used a bit? No? Oh, you just scratch your chin. <laughs> right. Okay, well, if, if you do happen to use game there, it's exactly what it says. This is a situation where you have at least two decision makers, unless you're arguing with yourself, of course, and you're trying to come up with a solution to some type of conflict. We call that game theory. So that's given at the top here. On the left-hand branch here, I'm going to call these non-quantitative approaches. So let me just think. I think that... You, you mentioned, Lawrence, you're taking me to the, grat, to the faculty club later on. Okay, you might ask me what I like to have, let's say, a wine or a whiskey. Ask me. <laughs> a whiskey. No, no, ask me. No, I'm not. <laughs> Keith, what would you like? What would you like? <laughs> well, let me think. A whiskey's worth 25.2, wine is worth 13.7. So, 
So you don't respond like that, of course. What you say is, well, thank you. I'd prefer to have a whiskey at the grad club. Well, lo and behold, on this side right here, they assume exactly that type of quantitative information. Whiskey is, say, 16, and then wine is worth 7. Over here, they simply ask for relative preference information. I'd prefer to have that beverage, thank you, over the other one. So that's all we assume in, this, in these ideas right here. I'm going to be using a technique down here that we developed at the University of Waterloo over the last 30 years called the graph model for conflict resolution, and it depends on all of these. Now, we have used these more quantitative approaches where they assume cardinal preference information or utility values, but for the social conflicts, they simply don't work. You can't get that type of information. So that's just sort of putting it into perspective these different techniques, and we're going to be talking about that branch right there. Just one final comment, it's sort of like any type of technique. You have your problem here, let's say it's a conflict problem, a social problem. Well, we can only have relative preference information. We assume they're going to think like chess players in terms of moves and counter moves. Are there some techniques available to do that? It's exactly the same thing in the physical sciences. This problem has these key characteristics. What methods do we have in the physical sciences to model that so we can understand better what's happening? Okay, so it's the same type of philosophy. Okay, I'm this, this is actually a design of a decision support system. We're going to talk about our input to the system. We're going to have an analysis engine where we look at the moves and counter moves of the players. And over here, we're going to get out the output. What are the possible compromise resolutions? Okay, let's now take a look at an application. That was just sort of an overview. I wanted you to have a, a good idea of what's really happening when you link decision making in society and the physical systems. There's a lot of good stuff out there. You have to sort of get a toolbox of things that are going to help you to come up with better decisions. Now, I'm going to be talking about a conflict that took place just west of Toronto there, north of Waterloo in the city, city of Elmira, the town of Elmira, where they had a big problem that took place about 30 years ago. Here's another map. It's located about there in southern Ontario. I guess we're right up about there. And here's another map just showing where Elmira, just north of Waterloo, is located. Okay, let's take a look at it. Now, how many in the room, by the way, heard about the Elmira groundwater contamination dispute? Okay, you heard about it up there. And what did you think of that dispute? That, that was actually the Walkerton one. That's where, that's where the Simonella got into the city, city supply. But, but this one is sort of similar. That's where they had this carcinogen that got into the underground water. Then they found out the general population. And then, wow, that had the front page of the newspapers for months after months. Sort of a very serious problem that took place. Now, we did pass out a paper. I always like to give something to take home. I'm going to show a couple of the tables there in the paper so you have a little notes later on. The first part here then actually gives sort of a background of this idea of these systems techniques that are available for use in decision making. We should take a look at both the physical systems and societal systems problem. And then you can see there we'll get into the Elmira conflict. Let me give you the page here. Yeah, starting then on page number 764, applying GMCR2, that means a graph model for conflict resolution to an aquifer contamination problem. And I'll be, I'll be showing that example here. I'll be going well beyond that, of course. I want to tell you what's happening in the future. But let's take a look at that dispute. So here's what happened. Elmira is a town of 7,500 7, residents located in southern Ontario. They take all of their water from the underground water aquifer. It's about 100 kilometers from each of the Great Lakes, and so therefore they're pretty well stuck with groundwater to, to use for drinking water in industry. In 1989, the Ontario Ministry of the Environment, they discovered that the aquifer was contaminated by carcinogen. And while if you want to see trouble, just tell the people that they're drinking poison water. Wait till this starts happening in countries like China and India, where they start telling the public, this is the stuff that you've been drinking. All that you have to do is get a sample from the tap, take it somewhere else, and analyze it and tell them what they're drinking. And they'll, they'll be shocked. I mean, 
There's so much contamination of drinking water around the globe. Hopefully we catch it here. Unirail Chemicals, that, that was the name of the company at that time. Now it's owned by Lanxis. They were considered to be the immediate culprit. And therefore they investigated, they put, they bo put boreholes into the ground, brought up samples. And indeed, all this was coming from the Unirail site where the chemical plant is located. So we have the culprit. That was the Unirail Chemical Company. Here's actually a shot of the plant right here, just taken very recently. Now it's called Lanxis. There's a, there's a tanker entering the, the plant area. Now this picture here, this was actually taken on the roof of an environmental consulting company right beside where the pollutant originally came from. So what happened is the Ministry of the Environment, they issued a control order. This is the way the law works. The, the soil is contaminated, you have to clean it up, and here's how to do it. Well, what they can do by the law, they can actually appeal the control order. That sort of makes sense because they may say, well, this is unreasonable, shouldn't we clean it up this way? So I think that's probably fine. But once you get into negotiations, then you could be running into problems. So the, the, the Unirail then appealed the control order. The regional municipality of Waterloo and Woolwich Township, we call them the local government, they hired consultants and obtained legal advice. Because they saw the problem the same way, we linked them together as one decision maker or player. And then negotiations involving the three decision makers took place in mid-1991. So we actually did model this as it was ongoing when we were developing earlier versions of the model. We had an expert who knew the conflict inside out, was following it very closely, and we would ask him for the information about the dispute. There's a, there's a photograph taken of one of the part of the factory. You can see in the background, those are actually farm fields from the Mennonite farmers. This, this, in, this pollutant was going from these tanks that were buried underground, the current production of that type of chemical into the stream. And of course that then, some of it went in the underground, some went downstream. So they were quite concerned, these farmers, and so were the people in Elmira. That's a nice old house taken right beside the chemical plant. It's actually quite a nice town. There, once again, is a map of the location. Shot of the chemical plant right there, and there's where it's located. So I'm going to skip this slide right here. Now, take a look at this right here. You can take a look. This is on page 765 in your paper here, to this table. Now, let me ask a question. Why do we use mathematical models at all? What is the reason for that? Now, some of you students would say, well, we're trying to torture you. That's why we teach you these, about these mathematical models. Go ahead. Simulation. You could use them for simulation. That's one use. Sorry? Couldn't, so sort of manipulate variables, did you say? Oh, prediction, yeah, prediction, that's, that's, that's one use, yep. And even more basic than that. Do experiments with them? You could maybe do experiments, yep, yep. Yeah, and that's sort of connected to simulation, yes. Sorry? More objective, more objective. More objective, what do you mean by that? Right, yeah, yeah, you, you might make a hypothesis, test it out. No, uh, the, 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 uh, it's, it's uh, digital, easy to digitize, and it gives you a structure. That's right, yeah, you can actually then program and you have a structure, exactly. And I would even go more basic, basic than that. The purpose of a model is really to try to understand the problem better, so then we can discuss it with others and maybe come up with some good solution. I would argue that all modeling really has that basic underlying purpose. You might think when we have very complicated models like they do in groundwater pollution, looking at the flow through the soil, that wow, that mathematics looks pretty difficult. But the fact is, it's supposed to be a simplification. You have a language that you use within the model in order to explain the model, discuss it with others, and in this case, we're gonna say somehow come up with a resolution to the problem. So this is a little bit of the jargon that we use in the model, and like I say, it's really just a language of communication like any model. 
So take a look up here. Can everybody see that screen there? So on the left-hand side here, this is the model we're trying to put together. So you have a conflict, the key things, who are the, key, who are the decision makers with real power? Usually that's fairly straightforward. In this case, it was the Ministry of the Environment, Uniroyal, the company that did the pollution, and the local government. Now these are the decision makers with actual decision making power. There are other sort of stakeholders that are interested groups, but they're not part of the negotiation. So that was the first thing. The second thing we asked is what are their powers, or we call them options available, that they could use in this particular dispute. So for example, up here, Ministry of the Environment could modify the control order. That means that water it down a bit, maybe they'll take that version if you don't change it too much. That was Ministry of the Environment. Uniroyal could delay negotiations, that we call dragging your feet. Just like a little kid when you try to get them to brush his teeth, you drag them along the floor and they finally do it. So they sometimes do that, except the current control order. Yes, we're, we're guilty, we're gonna just get the mess cleaned up and let's finish it. Abandon the plant. That was actually also threatened in Elmira. And down here, the local government could really just insist strongly that they clean up the mess. So notice here then we're starting to sometimes use the word calibration. We're starting to calibrate the model with the key parameters or variables that are in the model. Decision makers, the options available. Now, when we explain a conflict, we, want, we don't want to have to keep repeating things. We have to be a little bit more, let's say, effective efficient. Here then we have a notation ends in y's. N means no, this option is not taken. So at, in this particular scenario here, given by a column, no, the Ministry of the Environment is not modifying. Yes, Uniroyal is delaying. No, it is not accepting the control order. No, it is not abandoning. And down here, no, the government is not insisting. So if you talk about a possible thing that could happen, it's much more effective you can just sort of write down the column like this. And once you get used to that simple notation, it's a really quick way then to transfer information, rather than having to explain it in English or French each time. So here's one possible scenario. This was actually the status quo. This is what was happening in the summer of 1991 in terms of the negotiations. Then the local government, now the local government spent millions of dollars hiring consultants. They put boreholes down, around the plant, they wanted to know how far had the plume spread underground, things like that. That cost a lot of money. And of course, they don't want that to spread too far, but it could, it could affect other wells in the town of Elmira. So they, they, they then strongly insist that they clean it up. So this then moved the game from this scenario to this scenario right here. So notice the way you can sort of write how the movement or dynamics take place. Now what happened next is that the Ministry of the Environment and Uniroyal they realized that this scenario here was more preferred than this scenario here, for convenience, you just give them a number. They preferred this state eight over scenario five or state five. So what they said, hmm, we could both be better off if we cooperate, form a coalition. So what they did is the Ministry of the Environment modified the control order a bit. Uniroyal then went from delaying to accepting, so they went to a Y here. The local government just kept on strongly insisting that they clean it up. So that then was actually the final scenario that occurred in this game. This is a quick overview. I'll go back and fill in some of the details in a few minutes. But you can see how the game evolved from this status quo to this point right here to this point right here. Now the, the local government was absolutely furious because they were not part of the negotiations behind the scenes where the other two players recognized they could form a coalition and then they come to a final resolution. So that's actually what happened in practice. They couldn't do a thing about it, the local government, because of the fact the other two had solved the problem by forming a coalition. Any questions about that notation? State number or state number? Oh, that's just a label. That's just for convenience. So I might say, well, here's state eight or state five instead of just saying the YN, YN, right? So that's just convenience. It, it has no, no quantification at all. It's just a label. Yep. Okay, any other questions? Questions about that? Yeah. Oh, good question. That's a very good question. I'll mention that later on. What, what happened is they did come up with an agreement, they cleaned it up, and I'll, I'll explain the calculations, how we came up with this overall finding. 
they actually didn't contain the spread of it. They're still pumping up water in boreholes around, the, around the, the factory. Pumping it up, treating it is a very, very easy treatment, by the way, to, to, to destroy the chemical. All the new things they make are being treated, being dumped into the stream. Now, the people in Elmira, they were so frightened by this that even though, though I think it was three out of eight wells were contaminated, they would not take water from the other five. So we built a pipeline from Waterloo 15 kilometers north to Elmira, and about 30 years later, they're still using that solution. So they're continuing to clean it up, but they, they will not drink any water from that aquifer. They're just terrified. When was that pipeline built? That was uh, almost at this time, within a year after that settlement, almost right away. Now what they're doing, by the way, they're taking a look at the contamination in the muds of the stream, downstream from the plant, because the Mennonite kids are playing in there. But that's sort of a separate cleanup problem from the one I'm going to describe here. Yeah. So in a sense, this did work. They did actually come up with a solution. This could go on forever. And that's why these problems are so important. You don't want to have a contamination of the soil to start with. It is not smart, because you simply can't make a lot of money from your economy and then clean this up easily. Any other final questions in about that notation before then I move on? Yeah, they have to pay for it. Yeah, they're they're paying for the cleanup exactly. They signed the agreement and they're they're covering all the cost. I, I forget what the total is today and today today's dollars what the amount is, but it's it's not minuscule. Right? Okay, so that then is notation. Let me just show you a few things that have happened here. I'm going to skip a few slides here. So now we're getting into the modeling. Remember we mentioned that the decision makers and options, and I showed you the why in notation. So let's take a look now, how can we make the game simpler? Notice we had five options, so if we have any mathematical students, that means we have a total of two to the power of five, 32 possible scenarios. So if you model the conflict like this, there could be 32 scenarios. I showed you three of them. However, the good news is in practice, most of them are infeasible. Do we have any computer scientists in the room? Okay, computer science, you always worry about the size problem. Now luckily here, we can handle the size problem, which is actually the number of states that could occur, because most of them could not occur in practice. And let me just explain that. So here, for example, here, here are the types of infeasibilities that could occur. Let me just show you one or two here. If you're using a computer program, we programmed it, you can, this will pop up on the screen, or you can do it by hand. So here then, notice mutually exclusive options. Uniroyal could at most select one of these options. Delay, accept, abandon, not more than one at the same time, because it can't occur, it's impossible. So those impossibilities, which often arise as mutually exclusive options, we mark them there and we simply remove any state from the game that has those in them. Now I could do that by hand, but it's very easy to program. Here's another thing that might happen indistinguishable states. Here, if they abandon the plant, a dash means a Y or an N. It doesn't matter if it's taken or not the option. If they abandon the plant, this whole column here is essentially the same state. The game's over. The company's left, left the country. It's similar when you have a company go bankrupt. It doesn't really matter who made it go bankrupt, sales, engineering, marketing, whatever. If it goes bankrupt, it's essentially the same thing. Nuclear war, it doesn't matter who drops the first bomb, you have nuclear winner, and it's essentially the same result. So we go through this, we get rid of them, the states that can occur, and here's what we end up with in slide number 34, and I think we might have listed these here. Yeah, if you take a look at the next page then, for those of you who have a copy, figure five there in the bottom of page 766, so that's the same table as given there. So there could have been 32 of those columns, but then we eliminate the ones that couldn't occur. It's very easy to do. Like I say, if you have a computer program, it can prompt you, and then, then it gives you the set of feasible states. So here we end up with nine of them. Just for convenience, we've numbered them from one to nine. You could give a letter, label, it doesn't matter. So here's one state right here, and then the ninth state is over here. Okay, so that, that's an important problem. We ask for minimum information from the user, decision makers, options, and feasible states, then the computer can easily generate that. Now we're going to get into the key part of the problem, which is preference. This is key to any type of sociological model. 
Somewhere under that model, there's always assumption about preference. For those of you who are in, let's say, engineering or computer science, operations research, optimization models, linear programming, you have a linear algebraic objective function, it might be cost. You want to minimize the cost according to certain constraints. Well, the costs, let's say, represent the represent, let's say, the values of the company in the sense that they want to minimize the cost. Here in game theory, we have to separately take a look at the preferences or value systems of each of the decision makers. So let me show you how that works. That's the key to everything. I'm going to skip a few slides. Just going to skip up here. Let me skip ahead here. Yeah, let me just go back to this one right here. Let me just reinforce that we're only taking a look at relative preference information. So I, I, like, I like the early example better, especially for the faculty club. I can simply say, well, I prefer to have a whiskey, let's say over wine, when we go to the faculty club later on. But we wouldn't attach numbers to it, as mentioned in this example right up here. I just want to say a few more things about preferences in case some of you are doing research in this area. A lot of our research focuses on value system because that, that underlies everything. You know, in the physical sciences, I'm not going to do this, but if I let go of this, Right, it's going to hit the floor, we know gravity. What happens in the social sciences is you have these different stakeholders or individuals or organizations and they have certain values that underline the decisions they make. Then of course if you have some issue, their values differ and that's why conflict arises. So it's extremely important to look at that when we look at conflict. So up here, first of all, we're going to look at relative preference information. There's something called ordinal and strictly ordinal. That's where, let's say, I have Coca-Cola, Pepsi, water, and maybe wine from most to least preferred. It's an ordering. Sometimes we have things that, that are, it's a strict ordering. There's no equally preferred. Up here, we can also allow for equally preferred. Intransitive. How many have heard of intransitive preferences? Okay, I might prefer, let's say, Chinese food to Japanese food because there's more variety. Japanese food to German food because it's healthier and maybe German food to Chinese food because let's say the portions are larger. So quite often in our minds, we do think intransitively. Now in most economic models and all these quantitative types of approaches, they always assume transitivity. We don't. And the reason is because people do think intransitively. So we can actually handle that situation too. If we have some uncertainty, we've dealt research to look at that. And sometimes we have strength of preference. I'm an environmentalist, I really don't like the situation where the company pollutes compared to where it doesn't. So we actually do a lot of research looking at a lot of things doing with values. I just wanted to mention that right now just in case some of you are doing research in the area. So let me get back then to the problem. I'm going to skip ahead here. Okay, take a look at this slide right here. This is actually then figure number seven on page 767, if you have a copy of the paper there. And I'm going to actually go back, I'm going to go back one slide here. Does that go back? Just a sec. Okay, let me just go back one slide. So I want to ask you a question. We're going to take a look at this then from the Ministry of the Environment's point of view, as mentioned at the top there. What do you think in this conflict the Ministry of the Environment most prefers to see happen? What's most important to the Ministry of the Environment? Anybody want to guess? Yeah, and also the public. Yeah, and also the public. Yeah, that's right. And what does that mean in terms of this conflict? Sorry? Yeah, they'd like to see it cleaned up. That's right. Yeah. Now, that's what we, we initially thought. Then we thought about it a little bit more carefully with the guidance of the expert. And actually, they were also even more preferred that they not lose jobs. They didn't want to see the company leave Elmira and then we lose all those jobs. So actually, not losing the jobs, therefore they don't abandon the plant, a very close second was actually then cleaning up the mess. So let me just show you how we write that down. And what happens if you're a consultant, you'd simply ask the client, well, what's most important to you? What's next most important? What's least important? What about the other side? What do you think of their preferences? But you do that separately. So here then, this negative four simply means option four is not taken. They don't abandon the plant, they lose the jobs. It's going from most important at the top to least important at the bottom. Three is where they accept the current control order, they clean it up. And we can even have if and only if statements as given down here. Now I'm going to write that in English. That's just how we type it into the computer. Let's go to the next step here. 
Right, take a look here. Now this was the list of the option numbers. That's just for convenience, we're using those option numbers. Don't take option four. The Ministry of the Environment most prefers that Unit Royal not abandon its Elmira plant because they'll lose the job. Next most important, the Ministry of the Environment would like Unit Royal to accept the current control order. They want the mess cleaned up. And then you go down the list. I'll just translate this into English. The Ministry of the Environment prefers that local government insists that the original control order be applied, that means take option five, if and only if it does not modify the control order. That means don't take option one. We think this is pretty close to the way people think in practice when they look at a conflict. So we actually then said, well, how do we think people express their preference? And we think they express it in preference in statements like these. Let's see what that means. Let's go to the next slide. Notice that the most important for it the Ministry of the Environment, is that Unirail not abandon its plant. Okay, now take a look at this next slide here. Here we have, from left to right, most preferred in the left to least preferred in the right, the states according to preference. There's a simple algorithm that actually manipulates that according to those preference statements. But here's what it means. They most prefer that Unirail not abandon the plant. That means an N along here, each of these states. This set of states is more preferred than this column here. That's where they abandon the plant. Let's go back to the next most important preference statement. Next ministry would like Uni Ministry of the Environment would like, like Unirail to accept the current control order. Okay, accept it, that's where we have a Y opposite accept. So notice that this set of states here, they're further to the left, so they're more preferred than that set right there. So you can see what these statements are doing. They keep dividing the possible states into sets, and in this case we eventually ended up with an ordinal ordering of states from most preferred on the left to least preferred on the right. Now does that sort of make sense to, to the people here? Because like I say, this is by far the most important part, and this is where all the game theorists get hung up. How the heck do I get the preferences in reality? We think this is an easy way to do it, and we think that this very simple idea here was the best thing that happened in the work that we were doing in game theory, because we could somehow, in a reasonable way, get the preferences. So that sort of makes sense what I stated right there. Okay, so another point let me just mention is if you have partial preference information, well, I know that this is most important to me and this is probably least important, you can actually order the states and still do an analysis. In other words, you don't have to have a complete ordering of states from most to least preferred. Okay, so I, I hope that sunk in a bit. That's the key part then, the preferences. We do that separately for each of the players in the game, and then we end up with the ordering of states. Now this here, we have the numbers for the states. Most preferred on the left to least preferred on the right. Let's just double check that. Notice we have, we have up here, seven, three, four, and nine is least preferred. Let's go back here. 7, 3, 4, state 9 is least preferred. Okay, now we go through similar things for Uniroyal. We, we say, well, what's most important to Uniroyal? What's next important, least important? Then we can order their states. And likewise with the local government. And I think you could probably pretty easily figure out how to do that if you looked at just what I've said so far in my explanation. So then this, there's a, quite a nice discussion in here on, after that figure number 6. We go into the discussion of how the preferences are done then for each of the players separately on the next page. Okay, so we have then our game model. Decision makers, what they can do, we know the possible scenarios, we know the preferences. Now we're going to go to the chess part of how we analyze states for stability. Yeah. We could actually draw it as a graph too, but I'll the reason why we call it the graph model, by the way, each node there is a state. So one of the players, for example, Ministry of the Environment can, can control the movement from the first state to state number two by changing its option selection. So you can draw it in a graph as you like, but that's the underlying theory. Okay, I'm just going to skip a little bit ahead right to there. Okay, let me ask a question. Do we have a few math mathematicians here? I think we had a computer science, a couple of engineers. If you have something in a graph, in this case we could have the movements in the graph. This player can control the movement from state one to state two, put a one at, a, at an entry in the graph. I prefer this state, this state over that one. There might be a one at that entry in a different, different matrix, let's say. 
Anything you have in a graph, you can always write down in matrices. You can always put that information into matrices. If you have matrices, you can automatically do mathematical manipulations. So that's the one nice thing about graph theory. Graph theory then is sort of right brain thinking. You can sort of write things down, see what it looks like, but then you can transfer that to some type of mathematics. Okay, I just say that as a side in case you're doing research in this area. Let's now take a look at the chess game. How many have heard of John Nash? Okay. How many saw the movie A Beautiful Mind? So it was a great movie. He had a very simple idea when it comes to a conflict like that. What he said, if the game were at a given state, at a given situation or scenario, can I on my own move to a better position? Right, I move over here and I prefer that situation. Well, the answer is no, it doesn't make sense. So that's all he said. That, he won the Nobel Prize for that. That was the basic idea. Yeah, the, if, if you can't improve on your own, why do it? Well, other things can happen too when you look at, at conflict. For example, this is the technical terminology we use, but we would never say it like that to a client. I have a possible improvement, but the other players can move to put me in a worse position, so I'm better off not to move. Vietnam War, the Americans thought, well, maybe we should invade overland into North Vietnam to solve this problem. That wasn't a good idea, by the way. But then they thought, well, maybe China might do the same thing it did in the Korean War and then move into North Vietnam. So, so they realized it'd probably be worse off. In this case, they ended up bombing North Vietnam. The whole idea wasn't good, but that's what they did. Symmetric meta-rationality, I have a possible improvement. The other player can block it, but I can't escape from that block. So it's sort of like a chess player. Hmm, before you make the movie think, well, I'll move here. If the other chess player moves there, then I move there. If I end up worse off in the long run, I'm better off not to make that move. <clears throat> Just to mention a few more. This one here is quite a nice one, sequential stability. I have possible improvements. I can make on my own. The other player can't stop me. Uh, sorry, I, rather, I can make that on my own, but the other player then might have an improvement that puts me in a worse position. So that's what we call sequential stability. Down here, limited move stability, let's say of length n. I, I, I can move, the other player can move, then I can move again. If, let's say, after h steps, let's say h or n is equal to 10, after 10 steps, I'm worse off, I'm better off not to move. And down here, we have the infinite clever chess player. I can think into the infinite future. So the mathematician, we can actually solve that. We, it's very easy to do you end up with what are called cycles. Therefore, once we see it repeating, we know what the answer is. So the ones in the middle here tend to be the reasonable one. Nash is a very good one. If I can't improve on my own, there's no possible unilateral improvement. I'm better off to stay where I am. This is a pretty good one right here, too. We instantaneously can do all those calculations on a computer. For small games, you could do the calculations by hand. So let me just show you a few things. Let me just show you how this works. This idea of move and counter moves. We think that's the way people think under conflict. In economics or classical game theory, you might say, well, I want to maximize it by expected value. Well, that really doesn't make sense because people, I think, think in terms of moves and counter moves. So let's say we're looking at this state right here. Here, then, the Minister of the Environment, yes, it's modifying the control order. Unirail is say, yes, it's accepting it. Down here, it's not abandoning it, and the local government is not insisting. Okay, so we're going to look at the state from the local government's point of view. You put yourselves in the shoes of that player. What could they do from this state right here? Well, here, notice they have a unilateral improvement to state 8. That's because if you go back to that other slide, this state is more preferred than that by Uniroad. They go from not insisting to strongly insisting. Right, so they can prove on their own without the other players doing anything. However, Notice here then that Uniroyal can go from this state to this one down here by simply then going from accepting to abandoning, excuse me, its plan. So they have a possible move they can make on their own. Uniroyal then could put them in the worse position. They're better off to stay there because they'll end, worse, they end up being worse off. That's how the calculations work. Now they can get sort of complicated when you get more than two players and everything else. But we can handle that and we can explain to a user why this state is stable for a given decision maker. Okay. So I'm just going to mention a couple of more things here and then just say a few things about what's happening now and in the future. 
So here's our philosophy. What you want to do usually, what is the best that I can do on my own in a given dispute? Then you ask the question, well, if I cooperate with somebody else, can I do it even better? The answer is usually yes, but not always. So we always take a look at what is called non-cooperative behavior, where it's sort of my own self-interest only, but then let's take a look at cooperative behavior to see if we could do even better. I'm just going to flip ahead here. Yeah, here's that same slide then from before. Just to summarize and what we've done fairly quickly here, this was the status quo state. Notice then this was a situation when the negotiations were taking place during the summer of 1991. Here then Unirail is delaying the negotiations. The local government is not insisting. Then they go from insisting, from not insisting to insisting, they put a lot of pressure on the Ministry of the Environment and Unirail. Notice the other two players remain at NYNN, NYNN, so this is unilateral, on its own. The local government can move. When they got to this state, it actually was stuck there for quite a few weeks. The reason it was stuck there, notice we mentioned up here, it's a transitional non-cooperative equilibrium. When we went through those calculations, I mentioned moves and counter moves, if any player tried to move on their own, they ended up worse off. However, if they move together, this case, Ministry of the Environment and Unirail, they can move to a more preferred state by the Ministry Minister of the Environment modifying the control order and they then accepting that modified control order. Down here, the local government could insist as much as it liked, but it didn't really matter. So that then is how the game ended up. And it was pretty close to which actually, what actually did take place. Just going to flip ahead here. Let me just see here. I just want to get one slide here just to mention a few more things. By the way, here then, let me just show you the photographs. That's sort of the nice farms in Mennonite territory near Elmira. That's where Home Hardware was started, by the way, in Elmira, Ontario. They have their first store on King Street in, in Elmira. And I think I already mentioned the new developments. There, there's the Canada Gajig Creek. That's the one that was, that was polluted. We actually took a group of students up, this, up to see the plant. This was two years ago, just to show them what's happening. Now, the one good thing is the plant is still in operation. As I mentioned, Banks has just bought it out. There is pollution there still, of course, but they're trying to clean it up. But what sense would it make to abandon the plant and then go somewhere else? It employs people there. They're trying to clean up the mess that's there. So I think it's good that they keep those jobs. Okay, now I'm just going to flip ahead here to a couple other slides. By the way, we do have a recent book on conflict resolution. For students here at McGill, you can download that free to charge because it's, it's published by Springer. The, the, the universities now are, pay, are paying money then to a company for both their journals and any books that are published. So just look up conflict resolution. You can type in any name there and you can download that free of charge. Let me flip ahead here. Yeah, let me just say a few things then about what's happening now and in the future, just to give you a taste of what's going on. So preferences, we've done a lot of work on preferences or value systems. What are some of the things that we've looked at and are continuing to expand? Unknown preference, I don't know what your preference is. I don't know if you prefer tea to coffee. Well, we just leave it like that. We don't attach a probability. We just leave that like that when we take a look at the moves and counter moves. And it all works itself out. Fuzzy preferences, how many have heard of Zadi, Professor Lotfi Zadi? You have, okay. Do you use fuzzy sets in some of your work? Yeah, we, we've found that, that it's useful in some cases. I myself have used a lot of probability because it did a lot of work also in time series and stochastic modeling, but it does actually work quite nicely for certain situations. There's something called gray preference, probabilistic, combinations of the above. Now here's where, we're, where we've also done a lot of work, attitudes. As I mentioned, if you have a positive attitude, you probably get a better situ among the different players, better situation than when you have a negative attitude. So we, we've actually operationalized that into our decision models. Emotions, I greatly prefer this over that. Down here, this is an interesting one, hyper game. Let's say labor and management are negotiating. Labor says, well, I'm going to go on strike unless you give me the best deal that I want, the highest salary raise for, for our members of the union. Well, as a matter of fact, maybe it's a, it's a bad economy at the time, and where they go on strike is quite low on the preference list. That's what we call a hypergame or misperception. 
Now we can actually then model these misperceptions and operationalize that to look at different problems. It's actually quite easy to do. If you have a misperception, we simply model the game the way that player sees it, even if the player is mistaken. So that's sort of a situation that happens a lot. Let's see here. I'm just going to skip ahead a few here. We've, if we have a lot of nice applications. In our research, by the way, this, this is the talk that I gave at Concordia yesterday. Okay, I'll finish up in a few minutes then. Thank you. Is, is that we like to use examples, simple examples, Delp, develop a methodology, and later on apply them to real world problems to see where the need is. So we have a lot of published applications of these methodologies in different areas. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sort of finish off here talking about, this is really taking ideas from the physical sciences into the social sciences, looking at it from a different systems perspective. So notice up here then, we have forward GMCR. That's what we just talk, spoke about. We have the input, decision makers, option preferences. Here we have the engine. In this case, it was these calculations about the moves and counter moves. And if you end up worse off, you're better off not to move. And then over here, we have the output. We have the possible equilibria resolutions that occur. We can look at the conflict, how it evolved over time, things like that. Now, this is what we call inverse engineering. We want a desirable output, but what is the input we need to get here, get there? So let me give you an example in conflict resolution. Let's say we're negotiating climate change or something else, and there's one player sort of holding out, maybe the United States. So what preference changes do we need by the Americans in order to end up with a good result here, let's say where they do start cutting back in CO2 releases. We can actually do that mathematically using the, these methodologies that I mentioned earlier. We have a general paper we published on this already, but all the advances here can be transferred to the inverse engineering problem. And down here we have what's called the engine problem or systems identification. Here's a situation that could happen in a conflict. I've I know what the input is. I've observed it. I've observed the output. I know what happened. What was the psychology of the, of the players in order to get, in order to have this input and output? Now you do have to make some assumptions about how human behavior is, but we have a general paper now that does give the solution to that problem, but still a lot of work to be done in transferring a lot of the ideas down to here. So this is really artificial intelligence, these two things right here. We're programming how people may think, and here we're using it in a completely different way than they do when they're looking at the big data problems which are popular today. And I'm just, let me just say, one or two more things, and then, uh, then I'll close off and I'm a bit over time. But I'm pleased to see that everybody here is very concerned about environmental problems. A key one, of course, is climate change. And I think it's up to every one of us in this room here to do something about it. And I, I'd like to recommend the first step. This wasn't in the expert report, this particular recommendation we did on climate change. But I think that any political party, we should expect that one of their platforms is where they're going to have economy-wide policy. Now that means something like a carbon tax, tax and trade. We have to price carbon out of existence. We do it in a nice way, but we have to get rid of it. So check your parties. If they do not have that in their policy and they say well, we're going to get new technology and all the rest of it, we know it's not going to work. How do we know that? Because we've observed what's happened in the past. So I hope you will get after your, whatever party you belong to, I don't care which one it is. I will say that Prime Minister Trudeau does have a good system for the country. He's saying that if a, if a province does not cut back drastically in carbon, in carbon releases, we're going to tax that province, but we'll give the taxes back to the province later on. So I think we need some real action from government right now because things are extremely serious in climate change. And like I say, we've looked at climate change negotiations too using some models like this. So real pleasure to be here and thank you for your invitation to speak at, to this wonderful audience. Excited. Let me just take my glasses here. Well, thank you. Yeah. Right. Okay, well, so thank you very yeah. much for this very thank inspiring, you. energetic chill, chill. talk. And um, <laughs> uh, will you take a few questions? Sure, I'd be we, delighted uh, to. Yeah, yeah. Take a look at chill here. Yeah. <laughs> okay. okay, thank you. Okay, questions. So